One of the authors, John McCransky of this is a here in Cambridge. He's a local <clears throat> meditation teacher. He's a scholar at Boston College in uh, Tibetan Buddhist traditions. Um, and he has, he's a Lama. So he's done three year retreat trainings and is very uh, sort of well regarded in the community for this practice. This is something he has largely developed from the more traditional Buddhist practices of devotional practices to uh, like Green Tara, Avalokiteshvara that we have talked about, the Buddha, the Bodhisattva of boundless compassion, refuge practices, uh, what's called guru yoga, where you know we, we sort of honor our teacher. This is in the tradition, in the Buddhist tradition. We honor our teacher with a devotion as well as deity yoga, which is I meditate on Green Tara, yeah, the, the divine feminine who comes and responds with mercy and boundless love when we're not well, when we're not happy and we're, or we are suffering. So this is a representation of these qualities that we all have within us. So he, I think, very um, skillfully has tapped some of these more traditional practices to say, you know, we don't need to be meditating on all of these grand sacred deities or these spiritual beings or even the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, but rather people in our lives that we have benefited from greatly, who have shown us um, deep caring and unconditional love. Yeah. So that if we are feeling that we are somehow alone or that we can't muster even the elements that we need to be compassionate, to be responsive to suffering for whatever reason, <clears throat> we can return to get in touch with those qualities, with that quality of heart. My sort of view is, it's not expressed in this uh, study, is that benefactor meditation actually could be helpful for these attachment issues that we were talking about. It's possible. It's a, it's a hypothesis. This, is, of course, has not been proven. Um, much of this has not been empirically proven. And yet, many of us know how these things work. They work well. Do they work well for everybody? Who knows? So this is why a lot more research, if we need to know empirically, needs to be done on these things. So benefactor practice uh, is that which <clears throat> has us consider um, who I like to call, what I like to call sort of our council of advisors, elders, of um, wise ones, who would be on your council when you're alone, when you're in bed at night, going to sleep, <clears throat> who helps you feel safe, who helps you to feel like you're accepted, like you are um, you're okay, as who you are, no matter how you are feeling or who you are. And so what we do with benefactor practice is to visualize a caring person, a figure, a being, it could even be a pet that shows us unconditional love, um, as well as guidance. So it may be a benefactor is a spiritual figure Maybe you don't know them personally. Maybe you do. <clears throat> could be a teacher, a wise one. It could even be a community. It could be a community of people that you have felt really safe within. Uh, a deep, supportive friend, perhaps. Deeply supportive, who only really cares about your well-being and resonates with you well. So they understand you and they accept you. They don't make life more difficult. It doesn't mean your benefactor is perfect. Okay, so that's the other thing. If you're looking for who is the one in my life that is so flawless and perfect that I can really, no, it's okay. The key is that there's somebody that we don't get hooked on the flaws, but that they have still shown us great kindness and love and continue to in the present, perhaps. Um, could also be a field of beings. Another sort of way to think about this is that um, <clears throat> this council or this field of beings, they may not even have a shape or a form, just in deep as a, a, a sense. 
the point here is is that there there are no sort of requirements for what this what these benefactors look like how they appear to you what's more important is how you feel in their presence and it may be a deity of some kind it may be a religious uh, being of some kind that you have long related to that you felt safe with um, but the key points here are that this benefactor brings a deeply caring, non-judgmental presence, a sense of acceptance of you just as you are, a sense of well-being, um, and that has that helps you to feel at ease, loved, and safe. Um, and so you might just already start to just sort of sit with and not labor at it, but just sit with who shows up in that place. If nobody shows up, that's fine. As I said, it may be the tree outside your window. I personally have had trees as mentors, as weird as that sounds to probably some of you. I think they are amazing mentors. According to the great forestry scientist, uh, Peter Voleben, has anyone read his book on the hidden life of trees? or secret life of trees, yeah. <laughs> and this notion too, one of the things he says is that trees <clears throat> have a very different sense of time than we do. But it does not mean they don't sense our presence. And the key he says, I, I heard him say this also in an NPR interview once, a tree, if you spend enough time with it, will sense your presence. I remember when he said that, I went, ah, it's like Treebeard in uh, The Two Towers, The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. <laughs> he, the Ents are very slow. <laughs> I love that movie for just because of Treebeard. And there's some, there's some evidence there to back this up, right? I'm not sure what the evidence looks like, but I, I do agree with with Dr. Voleben, who says that, yes, they sense us too. Therefore, I just gave you a case for why I have trees as mentors. <laughs> um, so it may be that. The other thing about the benefactor practice is what you might do, and you certainly don't, this, this uh, part of it doesn't require you to do, to do this, but you might also imagine a place in time, a moment. Maybe it was on a retreat somewhere, uh, at the edge of a lake, or you went hiking somewhere. A place that you felt safe, a place that you felt really attuned to your to the resonance of your own heart. A place where you feel safe connected and a deep sense of well-being, almost where you can feel your own presence. <clears throat> and so you can visualize yourself in this place. Maybe it's a garden. There is actually uh, a garden meditation that uh, I believe is on the YouTube channel, if anyone's interested. Uh, garden meditation where you sort of imagine your own garden and plant the seeds of your aspirations into this rich, dark soil that you water and then allow this to sprout, then you let go. This is a lovely practice. So it may be that you imagine a garden, but it's a place that you feel really special, safe, uh, and uncomplicated. <laughs> a place that's just not laden with so much complexity, but that simply is um, a wholesome place. And find yourself in this place, as part of the practice and see who shows up when you put the invitation out there, who shows up as a benefactor yeah. or benefactors, plural. It may be, as I said, a field of beings. It could be uh, multiple. And the key here also, the third part is that it, it is in the present. So regardless if you're drawing on a memory or drawing on memory in our class, Either way, <laughs> she's probably tired of those jokes, I'm sure. But anyway, um, 
that the interaction that you're cultivating is present moment. Really, and here's where mindfulness helps to kind of bring you into a rootedness in the present. Yeah? That the contact you're having with your benefactor is real time. <clears throat> and then inviting them, allowing these beings or this being to be present with you now. <clears throat> you basically are then uh, communing in your spirit, your mind, your heart with them. And recognizing that whatever you are receiving is simply now a deep part of who you are anyway. In many ways, you're simply opening the door to what you're carrying. Perhaps haven't been able to access it because of just the, the difficulties, the challenges, the complexities of life. And this is true for all of us. Stress tends to just get in the way and obfuscate any attempt at feeling gentle and loving. <clears throat> we go through our lives this way. <clears throat> so this is a way of saying receiving first, as opposed to Tonglen, which is just transmitting first, right? Which we did last time or two weeks ago, saying, be compassionate and bring it to others. Here we are first receiving. We are the receiver. <clears throat> 